Let the games begin. Thank you very much. As you know, the theme of this uh, conference is uh, on the Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life. It will be something like a hockey game. It's an essential topic, something you need to be in touch with, something I need to be in touch with. We have entered very unusual times, radical times, trying times, definitive times, cataclysmic times, times where mediocrity is no longer sufficient. You either strive for and achieve excellence, or you might not make it because we are at war, and our battle is not against flesh and blood. And so, through the course of this day, I'm going to touch on four facets of the Holy Spirit. The first presentation is going to be mainly on the person and power of the Holy Spirit. Then we'll talk about the Holy Spirit as the gift who contains all gifts. And then a passage from Scripture, the, the uh, Holy Spirit is given to those that obey. Let me say that again. The Holy Spirit is given to those that obey. The Holy Spirit is not given to the disobedient, which goes a long way toward explaining some of the mess we've had in the church for quite some time. The reason we have a mess in the world, a mess in the United States and Canada, it's not a problem out there. It's a problem in here. Because we have failed miserably, in many cases, in the church, to be what we are called to be. Jesus gave the church to hold creation in being. To the deg degree that we're faithful, to the degree that we accomplish our mission as individual members of the body of Christ, to that degree, we're able to hold the world up. To the degree we fail, the world begins to sink into hell under the weight of its own iniquity. One person at a time, that's how this battle is fought. You have an indispensable place on the battle line. Doesn't matter how old you are, eight or 80, your level of education, none of it matters. You're a human being made in the image and likeness of God, and because of that, you're called to fight the good fight. A failure to do this, and by the way, about 80% of Catholics don't even go to Mass on Sundays regularly. 80%. You wonder why we have problems? 20% of or less of Catholics in North America bother to go to Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. I have my own ideas about why that is. And certainly there are societal and cultural problems that contribute to that. But the problem is mainly not out there. The problem is right here, a crisis of leadership. 
we have become frequently weak in the knees and soft in the spine, afraid, timid. That won't get it. That will not win a victory. And so today, we're going to call upon the Holy Spirit to be with us, strengthen us, give us that bold spirit that will enable us to fight the good fight and run the race to the finish line. Let me begin by reading to you a section from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which I know you all have a copy of and you study rigorously on a daily basis. At the end of this conference, the doors will be locked and an examination will be given. <laughs> and you ain't getting out until you pass it. Number, <laughs> number 683. And uh, this, of course, quotes uh, St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This knowledge of faith is possible only in the Holy Spirit. To be in touch with Christ, we must first have been touched by the Holy Spirit. He comes to meet us and kindles faith in us. In virtue of our baptism, the first sacrament of faith, the Holy Spirit in the Church communicates to us intimately and personally the life that originates in the Father and is offered to us in the Son. If we have problems, problems in the world, problem, problems in our country, problems in the church, these can all be traced back to the problems in individual human persons. If we are out of touch with the Holy Spirit, we're out of touch with God. That's another way of saying you're out of touch with reality. One definition of God is reality. God is. Remember, God revealed himself to Moses, I am who am. And we have from the beginning in Christian philosophy intuited that to mean God's very essence is to exist. God is absolute reality. If you are out of touch with God, you are out of touch with reality. And that is a good working definition of insanity, to be out of touch with reality. Have you wondered, when you look around, see some of the things that, that we have to witness today in our country, in the world, it's crazy. It's insane. That's why. A succession of school shootings. Why wouldn't that happen? You evict God from schools. Nature abhors a vacuum. It's not going to be empty. It's not going to be neutral. You want God out, evil will come in. That's an absolute fact. Don't believe it? Stay tuned, because it's not going to get any better. It's going to get progressively worse until enough of us wake up. Much of this is our fault. It's our fault. You know, and we wonder why, you know, you, you watch the news and, and they're, they're astounded that this could have happened. 9-11, oh, how could this happen? 
How could God permit such an evil? You don't want God around. What do you expect? We have systematically eliminated God, or tried to, and I don't mean you, I don't mean the, the good people, but a large segment of the population, or at least a, a segment of the population that has power in politics and even in law, have tried to systematically eliminate God. I remember one of my philosophy teachers in the seminary. He was a very fine priest and a fantastic philosopher. He, I, I remember it was maybe the first or second class I ever had in, in philosophy. And in tears, in tears, and this is 20-some years ago, he was saying how society wants to eliminate religion expunge religion from the national consciousness and yet all the while replacing it with a religion called secular humanism. An atheistic kind of world view. Cold. Inhumane. And in that time, what have we seen? A death wish. A death wish. The Western world has a death wish. From artificial contraception to abortion, murder and mass murder, suicide and assisted suicide, euthanasia, from beginning to end, from the moment of conception to the last moment of natural life, we have a death wish in society. Why wouldn't we have trouble? And lots of it. The remedy to death is life. The Lord and giver of life, the Holy Spirit. From the very beginning, when God willed creation into being was the spirit of God, the spirit, the power of creation, where that began. I want you to ask yourself a question. Now, I know that you are good, good Catholics and good Christians for the most part. You need to ask yourself a question. Do I have a personal relationship, not only with the Lord Jesus Christ, which you certainly should have, you should have a personal relationship with our Heavenly Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the person of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever, on a regular basis, prayed to the Holy Spirit? Ha have you invoked the Holy Spirit before doing important things, before reading the Bible, studying the faith? Or you're kind of disinterested and detached from the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we need, there's been a lot of talk about it in the past few decades, but we are in need of a new Pentecost. We are in need of a serious new Pentecost. And without that, Nothing is going to happen. We need to get in touch with the power of the Holy Spirit. We, and you can do this in a formal way, in an informal way. You know, it has to happen. I, I suppose I, I, I've been waiting for a lot of these things to happen, um, you know, to come from the top down. People have an enormous misconception about the Catholic Church, many of them. And one of them is that we're organized. <laughs> we're not organized. That's a joke. <laughs> I remember a story from the Second Vatican Council. A certain cardinal was having dinner with two uh, Protestant um, observers or, or per periti at the uh, council in Rome. 
And they were kind of chiding the cardinal, like, well, the Catholic Church is kind of losing it, you know? You guys are slipping and, you know, well, you're, on, you're descending. We're, we're the ones who are ascending. We're opening new churches left and right in Central and South America and so forth and so on. And the cardinal kind of smiled. He says, so, so you, you guys think, you, you know, you may be going to help to facilitate our demise? And they, they, they just kind of looked smugly at him and the cardinal burst out laughing and he said, look, you're not going to destroy it. We've been trying to do it for a thousand and more years and we can't do it. <laughs> the church is a divine institution. The church isn't going to go any place. It's going to be here until Jesus comes again in glory. But there's, there's, you know, we, we love the church, love the leadership of the church, love your priests, your bishops, love the Holy Father, be faithful, obedient. Got to do that. That, that. That's basic. That's axiomatic. No question about that. Do not, however, use that as an excuse or a cop-out to sit on your butt and do nothing. If you don't strive for excellence, one person at a time, you will contribute to the terrible suffering in the church and because of that in the whole world. It's called personal holiness. The Holy Spirit is the author of that. He's the Lord and giver of life. If we have a problem with death, and we do, we need the spirit of life. Personified love. Now, there have been a lot of sermons and homilies on love in the last half a century or so. Rightly so. Love is important. So if I asked you on your exam this afternoon, uh, what is love? Uh, I know you would get it. And I don't know how many people are in the arena just yet. They'll be, you know, they're still coming in. But I, I would guess that uh, over 10,000 people, and uh, out of that number, if I ask you for the definition of the theological virtue of charity, not more than seven of you wouldn't get it. But for the sake of the seven, <laughs> charity is the theological virtue, and listen to every word of this, charity is the theological virtue by which we love God above all things for his own sake and love our neighbor as ourselves out of love for God. The indispensable prerequisite for authentic love is union with God. You better first have your love in place with God. I call that the vertical dimension of love, you know, our relationship with God. Then you are empowered by the Holy Spirit to love each other, to love all creation. That's the horizontal dimension of charity. What do you have when you have the vertical dimension and the horizontal dimension? A cross. No cross, no real love. No sacrificial self-giving love, no love, some kind of an imposter to the throne, some other emotion. Christian love, agape love, real charity, is self-sacrificing love. If I love you, if you love your husband, you love your wife, your children, and so forth, your friends, what does that mean? That means I desire the highest and best thing for you. 
What's that? Heaven. If I love you, I desire heaven for you, and I'm willing to do anything and everything to get you there, and some of you don't want to go. We need the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, in order to live authentic love. Love is not merely a warm, fuzzy emotion. Love's not just a feeling. Love is a decision. Let me tell you something. Some days I don't feel like loving you. You know, I've been, being ordained is like being married. It's, it's a very good analogy. And we use that analogy. It's biblical. You know, Jesus is called the bridegroom in Scripture, right? Well, if he's the bridegroom, who's the bride? The church, right? The church. Every priest is taken up in Jesus, the high priest, and espoused to the church. I've been married for 18 years now, right? I've been a priest for 18 years. Now, in, in a very real way, and, and, and it's a good analogy, it, it's, it's like you folks who are married. <clears throat> you know, some of you have been married 50 years. I met some of you yesterday or more. During the course of that marriage, that relationship, <clears throat> you know, as you vowed in the beginning, in sickness and in health, you know, good times and bad and so forth. Some days, you know, I work and slave and work my fingers to the bone and you don't appreciate me. Right? Some days, it isn't easy to be married. Some days it isn't so easy to be ordained. What do you need at those critical junctures? Love. Authentic love, not some secularized, diminished, distorted concept of love which just a, just an emotion. No. Self-sacrificing, crucified love. No cross, no love. No cross, no crown. No pain, no gain. Period. Exclamation point. No way around it. How do you sustain that kind of love? Only through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is like the fire that came down upon the altar of the cross, the wood of the cross, and consumed Jesus, priest and victim. And at the moment of our baptism, we are taken up in Christ. We become a new creation. Jesus, priest, prophet, and king. You share in that as part of the royal priesthood. We, we ministerial priests, in an essentially different way, we share in it too. But what's the essence? To offer sacrifice and to be sacrificed. That is the essence of the new covenant priesthood. That is the essence of Christianity. That is the essence of authentic love. Anything short of that is insufficient. So when things get tough, you have to realize that you need this fire who is the Holy Spirit. You remember what happened at Pentecost. And I'll talk about this uh, more at length in, in the final presentation this afternoon. But you remember that the, that, that the disciples were, were in the upper room with the doors locked, remember, for, for fear, fear 
of the Jews. The spirit we've been given is no cowardly spirit, no timid spirit. Now, I know a lot of you think pretty much like I do on some things, a lot of things probably. Look at our country, come on. Uh, look at the politicians that we have. Even some of the leadership in the church, I'm sorry, you know, I'm going to tell you something. I'm getting old. And the older I get, the ornerier I get. And I'm kind of impatient. And I don't have time to play silly games and watch what I say. It's too late to mealy mouth around. It's too late to play games with the truth. It's too late to hold back. I remember the, about the first public sermon I ever delivered after I finished my doctoral studies in Europe was in Pensacola, Florida. And I gave my personal testimony. And at the end of it, an elderly Monsignor came. The crowd was on their feet cheering. And I was all fired up with the power of the Holy Spirit. And this old Monsignor walked right up to me. He said he was shaking visibly. And it wasn't because of his age. He said, young man, young man, you can't speak that way in the Catholic Church. That kind of talk is inflammatory. And I said, oh, Monsignor, you better believe that kind of talk is inflammatory. Jesus said, I've come to cast fire on the earth. And oh, how I long that it already be ignited. No fire, no power. No power, no victory. You might as well roll over and play dead. Because you are without the fire and power of the Holy Spirit. When I delivered my original catechism lectures in the Diocese of Sacramento, we, we had so much opposition to the bishop and myself for doing this it was unbelievable, and it was a formal diocesan program. Oh, many of the priests and religious said, oh, the, this is pre-Vatican II. The people don't want any catechism. People would call up to register for the program, and they'd hang up on them. Priests got in the pulpit and said, you know, don't go see this Father Crappie, because if you go see him, you're going to see Satan. I was working for the bishop, doing his program. And they did everything they could to subvert it, discourage it, and destroy it. In the end, there was no facility in the diocese big enough to hold the numbers of people that came. Thousands. Young and old, 8 to 80, Catholics, Baptists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Pentecostals, Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. I did it for a year, one Saturday a month for 12 months. And a large number of people learned their faith, came in to the Catholic faith. We had Hindus and Buddhists entering the church. Why? The spirit of truth, the spirit of life. The human intellect is made for truth. The human will or heart is made for love or the good. And your heart and your mind will be restless until it rests in God. As St. Augustine said, we have to take the initiative. And that means you in your own place. Now, I don't mean you have to go out and preach on a street corner. What I mean is in your own place, in your own vocation, be strong in the Lord. Draw close to the person of the Holy Spirit. You, you've got to do this. 
Don't let this go in one ear and out the other, because I'm going to tell you something. Before I speak publicly again, there will be even worse problems in the United States of America and the rest of the world. You can do something about it. You can do. You have to do something about it. You know, we love the church. I know you love the church, and and I think you love your country too. We have a lot of our friends from Canada here. You know, part of my part of my family is from Canada. My, my half of my mother's family grew up in French-speaking Canada. You know, they were French Canadian, Fontaine. Canada has problems, like the United States has problems, like all of Europe has problems. It's like collective insanity. Some of the stupid decisions, and I mean stupid, inexcusable, ignorant, arrogant. Why? No Holy Spirit. That's why. How are you going to make good decisions? You know what one of the, the biggest punishment for sin is, I think, immediately, I suppose hell would be ultimately, but immediately, one of the worst consequences of sin is the removal of leadership. When the populace gets away from grace and truth and love and goodness, authentic good, solid, enlightened leadership is removed. Happened in the Old Testament. The Jewish people became unfaithful to the covenant. And what happened? They, they, they had leadership removed. And they lamented, Oh Lord, woe is us, we have no priest, prophet, or king to lead us. Well, open your eyes and see the weak leadership and know what the reason for it is. Very simple. Sin. That's the reason. Leadership is removed when a people, a nation, a world gravitates towards darkness. You don't want God in school? You want to evict God from all public places? If you are ignorant enough to believe that the founding fathers of this country didn't want God in this country, you are ignorant indeed, in plain English. And you know, we're taking it quite nicely while they hijack the country. And not just this country, all the Western world been hijacked by an atheistic, secularist philosophy and ideology. Culture is infused with it. It's like injecting death into the body. Well, don't just lay there and die. You better fight the death for all you're worth, because if you don't, I'm telling you, your children and your grandchildren are toast. This is the first time in my life that I'm certain the kids coming up won't have near the opportunities that we had. They won't, unless you do something. You know, there are all kinds of interesting, there, there's a lot of information that, that's available to us today. Um, we, we, with the internet, in the means of social communication, we have so much uh, at our disposal. Uh, I can do research now sitting in my office at home uh, where before I would have had to go to Rome uh, or, or sit in libra libraries for interminable hours going through card catalogs and, and microfish. And, and now I can sit at home with, with my dogs laying under my desk keeping my feet warm, and get all kinds of, uh, of research information. 
We have a tremendous problem with poverty, right? Even in this country, poverty is a terrible thing. We have to care for the poor. We do. We do. The Lord loves the poor. And you better love the poor or you're not a Christian. You, you better have a, a heart for the poor, for the hungry, the homeless, the disenfranchised. You don't have the Holy Spirit if you don't have a heart for the poor in plain English. Now let me tell you something about poverty in the United States of America. The 10 most impoverished cities. Detroit, Michigan, number one. 32.5% of the people living under the poverty level. You know what number two is? Buffalo, New York. Number two is Buffalo, New York, the second poorest city in the United States. 29.9% of people living under the poverty level. And Cincinnati, Cleveland, Miami, St. Louis, El Paso, Texas, Milwaukee, Philadelphia, and then Newark, New Jersey. Now these are cities over 250,000 people. And those percentages, it, it's between 24.2 and 32.5 percent of the population of those cities living below the poverty level. I am not a politician, and I don't engage in politics. I am a Catholic priest, and part of my obligation, responsibility, and mission is to convey the truth in season and out of season, convenient or inconvenient, accepted or rejected. And it's my duty, it's my duty to tell the confused politicians and political appointees, judges or whatever, that I will engage in my mission. And don't try to say that I'm engaged in politics. Don't try to say we'll remove your tax-exempt status if you don't watch out. You can kiss my big, fat Italian elbow. I don't have tax-exempt status. I gave it up more than 10 years ago because I knew they would use that as a lever to keep our mouths shut. And the day is coming. The day is coming where the Catholic Church, if we don't get strong in a hurry and united with the Holy Spirit in a hurry, we're, we're already we're already, never mind, it's coming. Got to tell the truth. We have frequently been cowed into guilty silence. We have been afraid to speak out full-throated and unsparingly because we are afraid to lose the stinking tax-exempt status. Well, I'll tell you what, that isn't the Holy Spirit masquerading under the specious pretext of a prudential judgment, it's gross cowardice. They go through with some of these unholy, sick, decadent plans, like the Freedom of Choice Act and so forth. If they don't shut down every Catholic hospital, they risk their eternal salvation. You cannot go along with these things. And while I'm at it, in case anybody in here is confused, you can't be Catholic and pro-choice. Forget that right now. There's a lot of confusion 
in the Catholic Church and has been for decades. Now, I'm probably going to say several things many times in the course of this day. We have a terrible crisis. It's a crisis of faith. It's a crisis of morality. It's a crisis of leadership. There is no excuse whatsoever. There is no proportionate reason for electing people that are so grossly, radically, and uncompromisingly allied with the forces of death. It's not possible. Catholics have been grossly guilty in many cases of facilitating the demise of this country, Canada, the whole Western world. When Pope Paul VI came out with his prophetic and magnificent encyclical Humanae Vitae, the vast majority of Canadian bishops wrote a letter, came to be known as the Winnipeg Statement, infamous statement. They rejected the teaching of Humanae Vitae on the, the sacredness of human life. You know, they believed in artificial contraception. Artificial contraception is intrinsically evil. Read my lips. Intrinsically evil. And there is no excuse for it. And those priests who have counseled people in the confessional that they can follow their conscience on this, they are grossly deceived and guilty of subverting the faith of little ones. No excuse for it, none whatsoever. Now, I started to tell you about these 10 poor cities, right? The 10 poorest cities in America. And this isn't a political statement. This is a moral statement, okay? Now, someone will misconstrue it, you know, report me to somebody, fine, make my day. All right, Detroit, Michigan, number one on the poverty list in the United States of America. They haven't had a Republican mayor since 1961. That's not a political statement, by the way. That's a, that's a statement concerning philosophical, moral, social, and cultural issues. Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, New York. Second on the poverty list, the second poorest city in the United States of America hasn't elected a Republican to office, a mayor, since 1954, when I was seven years old. Cincinnati, Ohio, since 1989. Miami, Florida, has never had a Republican mayor. Now, I'm not campaigning for the Republican Party. I'll tell you something. I used to be a Republican. I'm not anymore. They aggravated the heck out of me. I'm not a Democrat, and I am not a Republican. And I'm not a politician. Some of you may think I'm sounding like one, but I'm not. I'm concerned about the morality of my country. Listen to this. The moral demise of a nation always precedes the ultimate demise of a nation. We are going down unless we wake up. And the only way that's going to happen is one person at a time. That's your mission. Be one with the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to empower you. Be open. <laughs> you know, Albert Einstein once said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. 
So, you know, we, we, we elect certain kind of politicians over and over and over and over again and expect different results. Forget it. You get what you deserve. They're both corrupt. They're both decadent and they're both cowards, both sides. You know, it's almost impossible to elect someone who's objectively and independently moral on every issue. Oh, they, they, they can rise to a certain prominence, but they don't have much of a chance of being elected. Why? Because most of the people have lost their mind. You expect a different result than insanity? When, when, when millions of technically insane people are voting? Look, remember what I said insanity is? To be out of touch with reality? God is the definition of reality. God is pure reality. You're out of touch with God, you're out of touch with reality. So don't expect anything other than an insane result until we inject some sanity into people. You know, uh, listen, it's the poor who habitually elect those who keep them poor. Let me give you a little quote here from Abraham Lincoln. You cannot help the poor by destroying the rich. You cannot strengthen the weak by weakening the strong. You cannot bring about prosperity by discouraging thrift. You cannot lift the wage earner up by pulling the wage payer down. You cannot, you cannot further the brotherhood of man by inciting class hatred. You cannot build character and courage by taking away people's initiative and independence. You cannot help people permanently by doing for them what they could and should do for themselves. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. He knew what he was talking, and his words are every bit as relevant today as they were around and after the Civil War. This is so true. And, and you see, there's such a lack of logic. Now, we've had some problems. You know, all the problems we have is because we're out of touch with the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. And remember, and I'm going to talk about it in the next session, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, knowledge, counsel, understanding, piety, fear of the Lord, and so forth. You don't get those gifts if you evict the Holy Spirit. Remember St. Paul said we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't you know you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? Therefore do nothing, meaning sin, to evict the divine guest. If you're living chronically in sin, you will, you will not have the Holy Spirit to guide you. you be, you're in darkness. How can you see if you're in pitch black dark? You can't. It's like a blind man. He can't see. Don't get mad at him. It's not possible for him to see. The, this, what you're seeing, this craziness, in politics, even in law, in society, in your family, among your friends sometime, you know how you, you just, why can't they see it? They're blind. Blindness is a direct consequence of serious sin. They are blind to the splendor of truth. They are deaf to the symphonic notes of truth. They're mute. They can't speak the words of truth. 
They're lame. They're crippled. They can't walk towards God. It requires a miracle to give sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf and make the crippled man walk. Indeed, to raise the dead to life. That has to happen one person at a time. Jesus will come in the power of the Holy Spirit through you and through me. And don't expect it to happen any other way. You have to do this. This isn't optional. You know, we're going to be called it at the end of our life. We will be called to give an accounting. And, and I'll tell you something, this, this scares me. I don't take this for granted. Don't think I'm in, in a different boat from you. I'm in the same boat you are. The quarry of ours, St. Jean Vianney, great patron saint of parish priests. And you ought, to read, you ought to read his life story this year. This is a year for priests this year. You know that. Holy Father has declared this a year for priests. Read, read about St. John Vianney, in case you haven't. St. John, one of the things, that one, uh, one of the many wise things St. John Vianney said, he, he said, I, I'm, I'm just delighted to be your brother in Christ through baptism. I am scared to death to be your pastor. And I know what he's talking about. Everyone, you know, you don't go alone, up or down. You don't go to heaven alone, and I don't go to hell alone, and so forth and so on. We don't go alone. You will take a large number with you to heaven or hell. We are responsible for souls. Each in our own way, priests in one way, the lay faithful according to their own state in life, religious according to their state in life, but we don't go alone. Don't forget that. Work assiduously. Work hard with all your heart, mind, and strength. You can't achieve excellence in anything I don't care what it is. Uh, I learned this very early on. Um, my father was a tough man. And he was my boxing coach for a while. And I wasn't immediately good at boxing. But it got to the point where I was scared not to be better than good. Because if I took a beating in the ring, I didn't want to go home and face him. That may sound harsh, but he taught me something. There is no excellence. There is no victory without blood, sweat, and tears. No pain, no gain, no cross, no crown. You're not going to be great in anything without the blood, the sweat, and the tears. And that's what we're called to, excellence. Contemporary society, with each passing beat of our heart, is degenerating. Not excellence, mediocrity, and worse. Individual initiative, drive, quest for excellence being drained out of people. You cannot be happy unless you strive mightily for excellence. Be the best priest you can be. Be the best religious you can be. Be the best mom and, and wife you can be. Be the best dad and husband you can be. If you're a doctor, be the best physician in the world. If you're a plumber, be the best plumber in the world. Strive for excellence, and you will be happy. You will have peace in this life and the next. And it doesn't matter your education level. 
your ethnic origin, how intelligent you are, how lacking in intelligence you are. Listen, my, my and I know this is true for many of you, my, my grandparents and great-grandparents, they, you know, they were immigrants. They had nothing when they came to this country, nothing. They worked 12, 16 hours a day, six days a week, two, three jobs, and were happy to do it. They were thrilled to be able to do it. I'm not saying this is a good thing, but in my house, where, where, where I could have learned Italian and French fluently by the time I was seven, eight years old. So then, by, you know, by the time I was in grammar school, I could be fluent in three languages. Didn't happen. You know why? Because in those days, the people were so focused on being a good citizen of their new country, they wanted the children to focus on English and whatever it took to strive for excellence in school. They were delighted to be citizens and productive citizens. Too many people today think the world owes them a living. And in our gross ignorance, we are encouraging that kind of sick thinking. You know, we've gone too far, maybe, with radical capitalism. The church doesn't support that radical, unbridled, out-of-control capitalism that has no concern for the poor. We don't support that in the Catholic Church. And it went too far. They took liberties. You know, they squandered money. There was corruption and greed. And now let me tell you the danger. The pendulum swings too far to the other extreme toward pure socialism, which is a curse. Eighteen ninety one, Pope Leo the Thirteenth wrote a landmark encyclical called Rerum Novarum. Amazing, 1891. And one of the lines from this, and we would do well to remember it in the Catholic Church and in our country and in the world in general. He said, so you think socialism will help the poor? I tell you, socialism will not help the poor. Rather, it will reduce everybody to the same lowest common denominator of poverty and misery while at the same time drying up the very sources of capital. 1891. Watch out, America. Watch out. The pendulum may well have swung too far to the right, the abuses of extreme capitalism. But watch out that we don't end up with a worse danger, swinging too far to the left with pure socialism doesn't help the poor. It reduces everybody to the same lowest common denominator of poverty and misery. Well, where does all the extra money go? To the government to expand power, not to help people. And so be very, very careful. The Holy Spirit is light. The Holy Spirit is power and courage. And every one of us needs this right now. Become one with that fire, that pure fire, the spirit of truth, the spirit of love, the Lord and giver of life, the Holy Spirit. Right now at this critical juncture in history, every single one of us needs to be one with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You become more like Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what brings you into union with the Father. Do this, please. Don't let this go in one ear and out the other. Fight the good fight. Run the race to the finish line. I promise you, in the twinkling of an eye, we're out of here. Life will give way to death. Time to eternity. 
but you'll approach the judgment seat of God with confidence. Because having done this, having operated in the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll be able to perform your mission. You'll stand before Almighty God. He'll smile at you. And you'll hear these beautiful words. Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Now at last, enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you.